All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. Everyone's out of school, so we appreciate all of you for joining us on YouTube and tuning in as we continue our series of live, free, no registration required broadcasts with some of the coolest people in the world. Today's focus is definitely on adventure. For those of you who joined us just a few days ago, we were joined by George Karunas, um, who I'm going to introduce in just a second, talking about volcanoes, one of his big passions. Today, we're on a slightly different topic. So as I said, we are joined live in Toronto by George Krunas, who is the world's foremost adventurer and storm chaser extraordinaire. I don't usually read off bios, but I'm going to do it for this one because it's just so much fun. So in his efforts to document some of the world's wildest and most amazing phenomena in places, he has been to, uh, just a few examples, the jungles of Rwanda to witness mountain gorillas, into a cage surrounded by great white sharks off the coast of Mexico, the remote island nation of Vanuatu, where he got married on the crater's edge of the exploding Yasser volcano, dog sledding in the Arctic Circle, kayaking with whales in Antarctica, space flight training, uh, to Reactor 4 at Chernobyl, and into the Nika Crystal Cave, among many, many other fantastic places. Is that all, George? I mean, that's just, is that last year or last week? or <laughs> That was just last week. Yeah, okay. It was a very busy time. Today, as I said, we covered volcanoes before. Today, we are going to dive in with one of George's biggest passions, storms, tornadoes, twisters, hurricanes, and more, and his attempts to document some of these most amazing of natural phenomena. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, George, and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse, and uh, thank you, everyone, who is joining from home. Uh, we normally do this to, a, to classrooms full of people, but instead, you're scattered across the world, really, from, from home, and I'm doing the exact same thing. So... Uh, as a professional explorer and adventurer and TV host, I'm not doing much of anything right now because all the planes are shut down. So I'm supposed to be inside a volcano in Nicaragua right now, but uh, certainly not there today. But what we are going to do today is talk a bit about tornadoes. And I've been a, a storm chaser since the late 90s. So I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And uh, I specialize in documenting extreme forces of nature. So tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, uh, caves, glaciers, uh, avalanches, you name it. Uh, that's what I go and I make television programs about it. And I do uh, science communication about all of these extreme forces of nature. And of course, I guess uh, COVID-19 could be considered an extreme force of nature. As a matter of fact, it absolutely does. But today we're not talking about that. We're gonna be talking specifically more about storms. So let me just pull up uh, my screen here and we can do some cool stuff. All right, let me just move this out of the way. That'll do. All right, so uh, one of my titles is Explorer in Residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and so I work a lot with them. I do work with National Geographic, the Explorers Club, Science Channel, the Weather Network, various different entities to showcase just how wild, powerful, and amazing the natural world is. So, um, so I really started getting into weather. Uh, I live in Toronto and I started getting into weather because of the lightning storms that we get here in Toronto. We've got the CN Tower. It's this extremely tall tower building that uh, gets hit by lightning between 70 to 100 times every single year. And each bolt can be up to 100 million volts of electricity at something like 50,000 amps. So if you're in North America, if you stick a fork in the socket, which you should not do, that'll be about 110 volts. So imagine 100 million volts. So these lightning bolts are extremely powerful. They burn five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Think about that for a second. As hot as the sun is, a bolt of lightning is much, much, much hotter, but only for a fraction of a second. And to me, this was absolutely fascinating. So whenever there was a big thunderstorm in Toronto, I would go and try and photograph the, uh, the CN Tower getting struck. It's one of the most unique and bizarre forces of nature out there that we've all witnessed. And, and of course, the, the, the thunder that accompanies this lightning is the sound of the sonic boom that is created by the air expanding around that channel of lightning as it makes that electrical connection between the sky and the ground. And so that's why if you're close to it, it's bright and loud. And if it's more distant, it's that low rumbling sound. So that's sort of 
the story behind the difference between thunder and lightning. And of course, light travels faster than sound. So if you are uh, watching lightning, you'll see the flash. And then a few seconds later, you will hear the thunder. Sound travels at about 1130 feet per second. So sometimes it can be many, many, many seconds between when you see the lightning and hear the thunder. And so I started tracing these storms back about 1997, 98, around there, and then just kept expanding into more different phenomena, more than just lightning. So things like hurricanes as well. We're not gonna really talk too much about hurricanes today. Uh, hurricanes are large clusters of storms that form over hot tropical waters. And of course, when they, when they eventually move over land, uh, they can do tremendous amounts of damage from flooding, rain, all kinds of wind, of course, all these different forces. So in my travels, I've been to about 20 hurricanes all over the world, including Sandy and Katrina, various other ones. Volcanoes, again, another one of my specialties, traveled to dozens of different active volcanoes around the world. If you check online, uh, you could see the volcano presentation that I did last week. This particular volcano is in the South Pacific country called Vanuatu. I've done numerous expeditions there and gotten extremely close to the lava, uh, bringing IMAX cameras down there, bringing scientists, various other uh, different types of expeditions. So I do a lot of work in Canada with the, uh, the Weather Network. Uh, there's a TV show called Storm Hunters that I partner with uh, Jacqueline Whittall and Mark Robinson. They're meteorologists with the Weather Network. And we have traveled all over the world together, documenting tornadoes in Kansas. We've been to hurricanes in Florida. We've been to uh, Mount Everest base camp up in Nepal, various other places. So if uh, I, I, we probably have quite a few viewers from Canada here on, on the, the session today. So if you get the opportunity, check that out on the Weather Network. I believe you can also find some of the um, episodes on Amazon Prime. But uh, today, all about tornadoes. So what is a tornado? Well. A tornado isn't a storm, it's actually a part of a storm, kind of like your arm is a part of you, right? So think of these tornadoes as being a bit of an appendage or uh, a piece of a much larger thing. The storms that form these tornadoes are called supercell storms, and they can be absolutely massive, sometimes up to twice the height of Mount Everest. So when the conditions are just right, and you've got just the right amount of moisture and just the right amount of wind shear. And wind shear is just a change in the speed or direction of the air as you go higher up in the atmosphere. And if that is just right, you can get these storms to spin. And if the spin is strong enough, it can extend all the way to the ground. And when it makes contact with the ground, then we have a tornado. Of course, that rotating wind is very strong and can do a lot of damage. So. When they touch down in a farmer's field, that's great. They're not harming anything. But when they hit a town or a city, similar to what happened in Arkansas just a few days ago, we had a very strong tornado hit Arkansas. They can become a natural disaster. They can be quite beautiful. Um, a tornado itself doesn't even have to be visible in order for it to exist. So what does that mean? Well, a tornado is a rotating, violently rotating column of air not necessarily a rotating column of cloud. Now, normally you do see a funnel cloud, like in this picture, this is from um, the town of Canadian, Texas. And you can see that cloud is extending all the way down to the ground and that whole thing is rotating. But sometimes the conditions in these storms are such that you don't actually get that visible funnel cloud. So you can have a tornado on the ground doing damage with a storm above it and have no visible connection between the two. So sometimes these tornadoes can be invisible, which makes them that much more dangerous. And what makes them even more dangerous is sometimes they will get wrapped by rain. So you get these curtains of rain that will spin around the tornado, obscuring it like a, like a shower curtain, hiding the tornado in this veil of rain. And that can be extremely dangerous as well because you can't see it until it's on top of you. So to put things in perspective, when we're chasing these storms, I like to um, approach from the south and this view of a storm with a tornado is looking at it from the south if you live in North America. And I would probably be on that road heading straight towards it. And 
the cumulonimbus is the name of a th that's the technical name for a thunderstorm. So it's the it's the grand it's the king of all storms. They are the biggest, the baddest storms, and they can go from basically very low in the atmosphere or, or all the way to the ground in the case of a tornado, all the way up to 50 or 60,000 feet, well above the height that um, an airliner would fly. So if there's one of these storms and you're in an airplane, they try to avoid these things like crazy because the wind is so turbulent and you cannot fly over them unless you're in the International Space Station. So that gives you an idea of how big these things can be. So you've got the storm, it would be moving from left to right as we're looking at this. On the left hand side, that flanking line is where the, the warm moist air is coming into the storm. It's being fed by warm air coming in from the left side. That air is rising up in the center uh, up to where you see that overshooting top. The rain and the hail is mainly falling on the left or the front edge of the storm. That's why a lot of the times you'll get a light rain, then a heavy rain, then hail, and then the tornado will come. So that's something we really have to watch out for. And so the tornado, you can see very small in comparison to the overall storm down there sort of at the bottom just left of center. So even the biggest tornadoes are very small compared to the storm that produces them. And here we can see um, the tornado there on the left the rain and the hail is usually to the east or northeast, or in this case, to the right side of the storm. And we have that thing called the mesocyclone. And that is the part of the storm that is spinning. And that part can go all the way from extremely high up in the atmosphere, all the way down to the ground where the tornado is. So these whole storms are spinning, it's amazing. And if you are miles away from them and you watch a time-lapse video, uh, do yourself a favor and go on YouTube and look for time-lapse supercell storms and you'll see these beautiful rotating storms. They kind of look like the mothership storm in the Independence Day movie or like an upside down wedding cake. They can be absolutely gorgeous. So when we're approaching these things to try and document these tornadoes, we have to be aware of all of these um, different hazards, not just the tornado. So there's the rain, flooding, giant hail. Sometimes the hail can be the size of tennis balls or baseballs or sometimes even softballs and those will destroy your vehicle. Uh, they'll smash the glass. Uh, people do get killed by hail. It does happen from time to time. Um, I've been hit by some pretty large hailstones that have left some bruises over the years. So what we do is in the morning, we'll make our forecast and sometimes I'll spend, in a two week period, I could drive 5,000 miles easily, somewhere upwards of seven or 8,000 kilometers. And we'll try and predict where we need to be, drive into position, and hope that the storms form. We have to be there sometimes hours before the storms actually form. And we'll encounter other storm chasers out there. Uh, this truck is a Doppler on wheels truck and it's, it's from Colorado. Uh, it's operated by a research team from Colorado. And what they do is they have these trucks with these radars on the back and the radar sends out a beam of electromagnetic energy, kind of like your microwave oven, and it can detect what reflects back. So it sends out a beam and then here's the echo coming back, basically. And that radar beam will echo off of raindrops, hailstones, things like that that are in the atmosphere. So they can use that to kind of get like an X-ray of the storm to try and see what the storm is doing. Is it, is it strengthening? Is it weakening? Is it rotating? And Every single major city has a large radar station near it that is part of a building that doesn't move. But these scientific researchers like to get really close high resolution data. And the tornadoes don't always form near where the radars are. So sometimes you have to bring the radar to the storm. And that's what these guys are doing. And so I've been working last year and well, we'll see what happens this year. My, I'm supposed to be tornado chasing in late May but I don't know if that's gonna happen or not this year. It's sort of up in the air. Um, but I work with a, a series of researchers from California. And what we do is we look at some of this high resolution radar data. And there we can see that, that rising section of the storm where the tornado would be. And uh, that area of red on the right is where the rain is coming down. And what we're doing is we look at this high resolution three-dimensional data 
And we try and get a, an idea of what's going on in the entire atmosphere from the ground all the way up to almost to space really. And we correlate that, we compare that with what we're seeing on the ground. So are we seeing a tornado at the time that we're seeing this radar image? And the project is called the Tornado Visualization and Doppler Radar Analysis Project. And so we can see by looking at this radar data, whether the storm is growing, whether the storm is collapsing and dying, because they'll go up, they'll survive for a few hours, and then they will basically just die out. So we use GPS to mark our location. We document what's happening on the ground. Is there a tornado? Is there not a tornado? And then we will compare that with this high resolution radar data, and then we'll make, uh, we'll publish these reports after the fact. So the reason we do this is to try and help understand tornado formation. Because sometimes you'll have storms that form that will produce a tornado and you'll have a very similar storm that's maybe 100 miles away or I don't know, 100 kilometers away. And it doesn't produce a tornado with very similar atmospheric conditions. So there's still a lot that we don't know. And uh, so that's why the research is still continuing on. But for me, it's, it's not just about trying to understand these storms, it's also trying to showcase to the public what happens in these storms. Here we can see, we've, this was from Kansas in 2016. This particular storm produced about 10 different tornadoes. And as we were chasing it, at different points in time, we had sometimes two tornadoes on the ground at the same time. I believe at one point there were three of them briefly on the ground at the same time. So they can be uh, really unpredictable. Only about 10% of the storms that are capable of producing these tornadoes that have that strong rotation will actually produce a tornado. So there's, like I said, there's still so much that we don't understand, but we do know where they occur. So when we sort of look at the world, we can see that there's a big blob in North America and North America, particularly the United States, gets about 75% of the world's tornadoes. All of the perfect ingredients that come together to make that recipe for tornadoes happens in the central United States. Tornado Alley, we call it. And that's uh, Northern Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. That area is where we get most of the world's tornadoes. And the US gets about 12, between 800 to 1200 per year. We do get them in Canada, in the Prairie Provinces, and in Ontario, and uh, much fewer. We might get maybe 100 or 200 tornadoes every year. But there are other little spots around the world that get them as well, but not quite as frequently. In Europe, they get them in places like England, in Poland, in Italy, parts of Russia. In April, you'll get tornadoes that form in parts of India and Bangladesh, and they can be particularly uh, damaging because the, the buildings are not so well built there. They do get them in the Philippines and Japan, parts of China. And then in the Southern hemisphere, we'll get them uh, during what we would call uh, winter up here in the, uh, in the Northern hemisphere, but it's summertime or late spring in the Southern hemisphere. So places like Argentina and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. And yes, the tornadoes do tend to rotate the opposite direction in the Southern Hemisphere because of the Coriolis effect, which is the rotation of the Earth. People think that your toilet will flush the opposite direction if you live in Australia, and that's not true. I hate to disappoint you, but the, the, ro the direction of rotation of your toilet has more to do with the construction of the toilet than it has to do with the rotation of the Earth. Sorry, it's, it's a myth, myth busted. Uh, but it will affect larger things, things like storms and weather systems. So the Earth's rotation does affect those things. So in the US, Tornado Alley, that area smack dab in the middle of, of, uh, of the United States, it also just so happens that it's really flat there and it makes it easier to spot these tornadoes. It's so flat, you can like watch your dog run away for three days, it's so flat. And you'll notice that Tornado Alley sort of extends all the way down to the Gulf Coast states. And that's where the moisture, that warm, moist air that comes up in the spring and summer, uh, if it goes north up into the, the central United States and that's the fuel for these storms. And then you get high level, very high altitude winds that help produce that spin. We call it the jet stream. And it's like a river of really fast moving uh, air 
that uh, can really put that spin on those storms. And notice there's a little mini tornado alley down in uh, Florida. They actually get quite a few there. Most of the tornadoes that form in Florida are the result of hurricanes coming ashore. So earlier we talked how hurricanes are these large tropical systems. Tornadoes are much smaller, but at the same time, hurricanes, when they come ashore, can actually produce tornadoes. So it's not bad enough that if you live in Florida, you have a hurricane coming ashore. Well, that hurricane can bring tornadoes with it. And they tend to be really fast moving too, so they're hard to predict. Uh, in Europe, there's sort of the breakdown of where most of the tornadoes uh, are reported. So not nearly as many as the US, but they do get them as well. And they can take all different shapes. Sometimes they're these tiny slender, almost like a, a rope. And we basically give names to different tornadoes based on their shape. So this would be a rope or, or like an elephant trunk, or sometimes we'll have a cone or a wedge tornado. A wedge tornado is a tornado that tends to be wider than it is tall. And they tend to be the really big, strong, powerful ones that tend to be the most dangerous. Although the shape of the tornado and the size of the tornado is not necessarily indicative of how strong it is. But in general, the larger they are, they do tend to be quite powerful. And the, the tornado you're seeing here is one from uh, Bennington, Kansas. And it just sat in a farmer's field for 45 minutes. It barely moved, but it was just sitting there spinning away, grinding up this field. But the biggest one I ever encountered, I don't even have a picture of it here because it was just not very photogenic, um, was one from Oklahoma. And it was Guinness World Record size. It was 2.6 miles wide. That's 4.3 kilometers from one edge of the tornado to the other. And this thing was just so big. I couldn't even tell that it was a tornado. It just looked like a black smudge across the horizon. And uh, no one had ever seen a tornado that big. We're used to seeing stuff like this. It kind of looks like the tornado from the Wizard of Oz, but they can take on these just massive, ugly, daunting, uh, real scary shapes. And sometimes they can be extremely photogenic. Um, a tornado that doesn't hit anything isn't really a natural disaster. It's a natural phenomenon. It's the earth trying to balance out differences in air pressure. It's just moisture and wind coming together in this, this rotating pattern. And if it stays out in a field, then it's not a disaster at all. They only become disasters when they hit cities and towns. So it's kind of, it's kind of us that determines whether or not a tornado becomes a disaster, right? And when tornadoes happen in places that are more densely populated, like east of the Mississippi River, um, that one in Arkansas the other day, there's quite a lot of towns and cities in, in these states, as opposed to places like Wyoming or, or uh, Montana, where there's, very, uh, there's only a few cities and a lot of open space, right? So tornadoes that happen further east in North America tend to cause more damage, because just because there's more things for them to hit. So I've got a video here of this particular tornado and just let me just set it up first before I play it. This was in South Dakota and luckily in South Dakota there are not a lot of towns so there's a lot of farmland and this tornado didn't really hit much so that's good and at the time I was chasing with a tornado chasing tour company. So I've sometimes chased tornadoes for scientific research, I've sometimes chased tornadoes for the weather network to, to make TV programs about them and then sometimes I've worked as a tour guide taking people on tornado chasing trips from around the world. And that's what was going on when this tornado struck. So let's see if this video plays. There we go. So there it is in a field. It's frightening some cows, but it's not really doing Charles, any damage. I got a crazy idea. Close? What? Close? Yeah. Let's do it. So at this point, I know the tornado is going to cross this highway. What a great tornado. Holy smokes. It's great because it's not hitting anything. And we can Whoa, see it very man, clearly. Tornado. But we know it's going to cross no the road. Up. So my mission right now is to try and find the exact spot where the tornado is going to cross the road right in front of me. 
And that little building is a small church and the tornado is going to pass behind the church. And at this point, as soon as I open the car door, the wind is so strong that everything gets sucked out. All my maps and papers and everything. And watch the oncoming car. Watch the headlights. Watch how close this car gets to driving into the tornado. How do you not notice that? Seriously, how do you not see that? I'm guessing that the driver of that car either didn't see it at all for whatever reason, maybe they were texting on their phone or something, I don't know. Or maybe they did see it at the last minute and they need a new pair of underwear. Uh, that would, that's, I certainly would. Uh, so I try to get close to these things, but we try to do it safely, right? The idea is to try and predict where the terrain is gonna go and then use the existing road network to try and get into a position where we can best see it. So here we were able to pull over to the side. Uh, the car that's parked ahead of me is, is a good friend of mine. He's a, another storm chaser. And uh, we were just in this perfect position to watch this tornado cross. And just seconds after it crossed the road, the tornado just dissipated. It just, just went away. And uh, the storm continued on. I believe it produced another one or two more tornadoes uh, later this afternoon. But uh, that was basically it. Most of these tornadoes form in the late afternoon. And the reason for that is that we need a lot of warm, moist air to be that fuel for these tornadoes. So the sun will heat the ground all day long and the ground heats the air. So when you're outside on a hot day, the sun isn't actually heating the air. The sun goes through the air, that, that incoming solar radiation goes through the air, heats the ground, the ground then heats the air, and that moisture in the air wants to rise up. And usually it's about five or six or seven o'clock in the afternoon when that air gets moist and warm and unstable enough for these storms to rise up and form in the atmosphere. But the conditions have to be just right. So we do most of our storm chasing in the afternoon. We'll spend the morning trying to get into position if we're lucky, a storm will rise up and form and uh, we'll chase it as best we can. Of course, the storms do not obey any traffic laws. Um, they don't obey stop signs. They don't, uh, they don't care about the road network, which is something that we have to take into consideration when we're trying to chase these storms. So it's tricky. Yes, it can be a bit dangerous. I've had the windshield and the glass smashed out of the vehicle that we've been driving. Um, but we try to do it as safely as possible. While we're out there, we will also send in our reports to the National Weather Service or to Environment Canada to let people know who are in the path of these tornadoes, uh, let the Weather Service know so that they can um, release these warnings so that people can get to their basement or get into a closet. And those are the safest places to be if there's a tornado coming for your house get underground, get to your basement, get underneath a, uh, a table in the basement if you can. If you don't have a basement, get into the bathroom. Bathrooms tend to be interior where they don't have a lot of windows. There's a bathtub, you can climb inside the bathtub. Maybe take a, a mattress or a blanket to cover you to prevent any flying debris from, from hurting you or flying glass. And uh, that's sort of the best thing that you can do. Cars are actually pretty bad places to be if a tornado hits because the car will get squeezed and crunched by the tornado and flipped. So it's not the safest place to be. Even though I do all my storm chasing in cars, uh, the trick is to not get in the path of the tornado. But if you happen to see one and you're in your car and it's not moving left and it's not moving right and it's just getting bigger, that means it's coming straight at you and you need to drive at 90 degree angles away, get out of there and if you can't, well, then get out of your car, get away from your car so that it doesn't roll on top of you. Lie down as flat as you can on the ground, then as low a spot as you can, cover your head and hope for the best. So those are my best safety tips for if a tornado is uh, coming for you. So if a warning is issued for where you live, that means that a tornado is either happening or is imminent. It's gonna happen anytime now because they're detecting that rotation on the radar that we talked about earlier uh, in the presentation. So we can detect whether the storm is rotating and if that rotation is increasing, 
they will sometimes issue a tornado warning because that rotation is capable of producing a tornado even though it hasn't yet. So we wanna warn you against uh, the possibility of that. Whew, that was a lot of information I just threw at you guys all in a real <laughs> short period of time there, but I wanna make sure that we have lots of time for, uh, for questions. So I think maybe we should throw this out for some questions. Jesse, what do you think? That sounds fantastic. Well, George, that was an amazing tour of tornadoes and, and what's great videos and pictures and all that great stuff. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, over 50 people tuning in on YouTube. If you guys want to type in questions in the chat bar, fantastic. I'll take as many as I can. But I want to start out with one of my own, which I've, I've never asked you in, in person. Um, we have these small towns and, and farm fields get hit by tornadoes. Could a tornado hit something like Dallas or Oklahoma City or take out a big chunk of a, a major metropolitan center or are the conditions not right for that to ever happen? Right, that's a great question. There's a, a bit of a myth out there that tornadoes don't hit major cities. And that is completely untrue. Um, Oklahoma City, although it hasn't taken a direct hit in a long time, I'm really worried about Oklahoma City. But we have lots of, of instances of major cities being hit by tornadoes. Uh, Atlanta, downtown Atlanta has been hit by tornadoes. Uh, Salt Lake City, Utah has been hit. I mean, it just, I could just go on and on and on. Uh, so yeah, they do get hit by these tornadoes. Cities are actually pretty small targets for tornadoes. If you look at a map of the central United States, you'll see Dallas, you'll see Kansas City, you'll see Oklahoma City, and you'll see a bunch of other smaller towns and a lot of farmland, right? So statistically, the likelihood of a major city getting hit by a tornado is relatively low, but it does happen and uh, certainly could happen to almost any major city in the US, right? It does happen. There you go, thank you so or much. Or Canada for a matter, for that, you know, for that case. I mean, we had a tornado that, uh, that just missed Ottawa about, uh, was it a year and a half ago, whatever it was, right? And that's our capital city. That's the capital of the country. There you go. I stand corrected. Thank you for, for dispelling the myth. All right, uh, Robert in Toronto wants to know, how many tornadoes have you seen personally? Wow. So I stopped counting at about 100. <laughs> I don't know exactly how many I've seen, but it's really interesting because um, usually I'll be out storm chasing for anywhere between two weeks to about a month. It really does sort of depend on my schedule and how the weather pattern looks. So we'll try to look at these long range computer models to see how favorable the conditions might be a week or two weeks down the road. Um, I've done two week tornado chases where I've seen zero tornadoes. I've seen lots of storms on those trips, lots of storms, a lot of supercell storms capable of producing tornadoes. But every now and then, like 2016, for example, just off the top of my head, I didn't see any tornadoes. Uh, 2015, I didn't see, no, I saw one, I think one tornado in 2015. In 2016, I saw 10 on one day in the span of two hours, right? So it really does depend on what mother nature wants to do and whether I'm in the exact right spot to, to, to witness them. Sometimes on these big tornado outbreak days, we'll have clusters of storms, maybe three, four, five, six different storms. Each of them may be producing tornadoes at different times or sometimes simultaneously. So for me to be at the exact right place at the exact right time, with just the right angle to be able to view the tornado with just the right road network is super difficult, right? If it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. Awesome, thanks, George. All well, right, uh, hey, sure. Mason and Juliana, Sterling, Ontario, they've been joining us for all our sessions these last couple of weeks. They wanna know what's the most dangerous storm you've chased. Wow, so the most dangerous storms, in my opinion, are the hurricanes. They are these, uh, you know, these massive storms, some of them can be 800 kilometers wide, like Hurricane Katrina, for example. That was probably the most dangerous storm that I ever intercepted. And being in Hurricane Katrina was kind of like being in a blender for eight hours, just debris flying and the, the, the sea level rose up 10 meters or 28 feet above normal. So everything along the coast was completely flooded. Anything that was you know, less than 10 meters above sea level was completely underwater. So I was in a steel reinforced concrete parking garage at the time, and I was able to drive my car up to different levels to get up above the flooding. And uh, every little raindrop felt like a needle hitting you in the face. And there were pieces of metal flying around like helicopter blades. 
So hurricanes for sure, in my opinion, way more dangerous than a tornado. However, tornadoes have faster wind speeds than hurricanes, generally speaking. Um, the strongest hurricane is equal to about a level two, we call the EF scale, the enhanced Fujita scale for tornadoes. And it goes from zero up to five. So if you've got a really strong hurricane, it can be equivalent to a level two out of five on the tornado scale, just to sort of put that in perspective. Yeah, very cool. All right. Um, Sarah and her kids in Guelph, Ontario want to know, has there been an increase in tornadoes in the last few years due to climate change? Great question. We don't know. <laughs> Here's the thing, is that we don't have enough weather data to really understand fully if there is a, a link between climate change and tornadoes. Now, when it comes to hurricanes, we know that climate change, that increase in incoming heat will, a lot of it is absorbed by the, most of it is absorbed by the ocean. Warmer oceans mean more fuel for hurricanes. It can also mean more fuel for tornadoes. There was a study that just came out not too long ago, only about a year ago, that seems to suggest that there is a, a correlation between Arctic sea ice levels and tornadoes. So it looks like there might be a link between the two. We don't know for sure if tornadoes are gonna become more frequent or if they're gonna become stronger, but it does look like they may be moving a little further east. So the conditions might be shifting due to the jet stream changing due to climate change. So these patterns and such are looks like, I mean, I'm saying that with great trepidation because we don't know for sure yet, but it looks like Tornado Alley might be shifting a little further east. And to me, that's worrying because we have higher population densities the further east we go in North America. Well, this is something obviously you can monitor over the next few years and we certainly hope that it doesn't come to pass, but I suppose we'll all see together what happens. There's lots of research still to do on that topic. Yeah. And um, it takes time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a thing that we cover in a lot of our presentations is that science is not something that is concrete and set in stone. It's something that's changing all the time that people can contribute to. So if you guys are keen to become storm chasers yourselves, there's lots of stuff still to do. Tons and tons of research left to be done out there. Absolutely. So. And yet science is, is still, it's the best tool that we have for understanding the world around us, for every, to understanding everything in the world around us. Yeah, fantastic. All right, uh, William in Sudbury, again, joining us for a lot of sessions lately. He wants to know, what's your closest encounter with a tornado you've ever had? Ooh, too close, <laughs> too close. I've been caught on the edge of the circulation of tornadoes uh, a couple of times where there's been debris flying, like, uh, like driving through a swarm of bees. And one particular incident, and if you look on, if you, if, you, if you search for me on YouTube, you'll find the video clip. Um, we were in Nebraska and a tornado just happened to form right beside us. And that's, that's something that always worries me when I'm out there because sometimes they can form very close to you. And the tornado was one of those invisible tornadoes that I talked about, you couldn't really see it. But what it did was it flipped a piece of farm equipment. There's these large irrigation pivots that the farmers use to water their crops. And it's kind of like a piece of scaffolding that's on a wheel and just rotates around the whole crop. And it was beside us on the road as we're driving. And the tornado took that, that piece of farm equipment and pushed it right over. And the end of it came smashing into the windshield of the car that I was driving. So I caught the whole thing on video and uh, it was, uh, was kind of scary. So we smashed the windshield and we lost the passenger side rear view mirror, but that was it. That was all the damage that we took, but it could have been much worse. So that has prompted me to maybe not get as close uh, as, as, I, as I used to. Safety yeah. first. I'm trying to find that video online. I've got Tornado Chase Close Encounter for you right now. It's about five and a half minutes, but if it's not that, we'll find it after the fact and make sure it's in the chat bar for people. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, you mentioned something at the beginning too, for anyone tuning in at home, Amazon Prime has both Storm Hunters, uh, which George talked about earlier, and Angry Planet, another series he was in for many, many years. So Amazon Prime is really great content to keep up with George. Um, all right, uh, Athena and Zoe in Water now want to know, how much warning do people receive before they can get to safety? Like, is there a standard for this or? There is no standard. So basically what it comes down to is what the National Weather Service or Environment Canada sees on their radar or the reports that they're getting. 
uh, through Twitter, through uh, storm spotters like me, and then they will make a decision to issue a warning. Warning times will certainly vary. Um, if you have 20 minutes of warning, that's really good. That's really good. Like how long does it take for you to get into the basement? It does not take you 20 minutes to get to the basement, right? So if that warning is there, then you generally have plenty of time. Now, of course, this is a tornado. These are, these are supercell thunderstorms. Things can happen very quickly. So occasionally you will get tornadoes that form and there's no warning issued um, at the time the tornado forms. Usually it'll be issued immediately afterwards, but yes, it is possible for you to be hit by a tornado when there has been no warning, but that's, these days that's rarely the case. The bigger problem is not so much that there's no warning, it's you hearing the warning, right? So that's why we have those special alert messages that come up on your phone and you'll get the crawl that comes across on your TV screen and the, that tone that will come over the radio or the TV, right? So there's different ways or the sirens. A lot of, a lot of towns have tornado sirens, uh, not so much in Canada, but in the US they do, especially in the central part of the US. So those are all different methods of getting the tornado warning out to you. But if the tornado happens at night and you've got your ringer turned off on your phone and your TV is off, you could be hit by the tornado, even though there's been a warning in place for 10 or 15 minutes without you knowing. So it's not a perfect system, but it's the best that we have right now. It's constantly being improved, of course, with longer, uh, you know, better lead times for these warnings, but it's not a perfect uh, situation yet. But and it never will be perfect, but it's very, very good. It, the U.S. and Canada have the best tornado warning systems in the world, but there's always room for improvement. Of course. Uh, I'm so glad we got that question. I want to stress too, and this is something that I I know you've been involved with uh, back when your Angry Planet days. We've got a session tomorrow with a guy who flies planes into hurricanes so they can get better data on how the hurricane forms. We can improve these forecasts. So uh, I think there's just a, a cool topic and a follow up for anyone who wants to do this in on this one might want to check on Nick Underwood tomorrow at 2 p.m. Definitely um, check that out. I have flown with the with the U.S. Air Force uh, hurricane hunters and it is a really cool experience flying in a plane into the eye of a hurricane. Check I, it out. I bet. Um, all right these are related questions and we'll wrap up with this. So Joe and Mason and Juliana wanted to ask how did you get interested in chasing tornadoes and how do I get a job like yours? Right so there's no uh, storm chaser school uh, the, you, you can't you can't get a college degree in in storm chasing or being a professional explorer like I like I am. Um, so for me, I was always interested in science and STEM, and I originally wanted to be a marine biologist, but um, I ended up studying engineering. So I used to build recording studios for a living, and I would take my vacation time and pursue my interest in science, nature, and photography, with an interest particularly in weather. So I would chase storms locally and I got better at learning how to forecast the weather. And there's lots of really great resources online that can teach you how to read computer models and how to read satellite imagery and how to read um, radar imagery to understand what you're seeing. There's more to it than just some guy standing in front of a green screen pointing at cold fronts. Um, you know, it's gonna be sunny in 25 today. You know, it, it, that's part of it, but it goes a lot deeper. So I had to teach myself a lot of that. I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of um, mentoring with existing storm chasers, learned from them, traveled with them, learned how to navigate around these storms. And then it just kept expanding more and more. And I branched out from thunderstorms into tornadoes, into forest fires, then eventually hurricanes, volcanoes, and every other extreme force of nature. And that's been over the span of 20 years, right? So basically the, what happened was, is as I was doing this, I was getting a lot of attention from news media, CBC, CNN, being interviewed by guys like Anderson Cooper and such. And, um, and then I was offered my own TV show. So it, it's just about, I made a name for myself and just kept learning and expanding and learning and expanding and learning and uh, just getting, just being out there, just putting in the effort to be out there. And a lot of my adventures and chases and expeditions, a lot of them are self-funded by me. Sometimes I work with TV networks. Sometimes I work with scientists. Sometimes I work with, I get a science grant or whatever from National Geographic sometimes. But a lot of it is just me funding it myself because I'm so passionate about it. I want to be out there and I want to show people what's out there.
Well, that passion sure signs through in every one of your sessions. Again, for everyone tuning in today, check out George's Volcanoes episode and Path. I mean, we've done like a crystal cave with you. We've done a whole bunch for you at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, so do check that out. And stormchaser.ca on his latest expeditions, adventures, and more. Uh, links to Twitter, Facebook, and all his social media. Some of the best, coolest pictures you're ever going to see. George, we really appreciate you joining us again today. Thank you, Jesse. I always uh, love being on with you guys. And uh, thank you, everyone who tuned in. Enjoy your, uh, your time at home and use that time wisely. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no excuse to not learn something cool while, uh, during this, uh, this, this period of time. Yeah. What a best, the best possible message to end on. So thank you again, George, for everyone at home. See you all soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day.